told us you like to bring a touch of fun to the business world and i think uh sabine already had this perfect this perfect description the lego spirit it's in your job title lego professor which is we learned from you is a branded chair uh, it's not only a pretty awesome job name is a branded chair that lego actually gave to you and to the world can you tell us how your how your job exemplifies what lego stands for like do you do you use lego every day when you show up at work like how is how's is lego a part of what you do every day well so i'm not made of plastic real human um <laughs> But the Lego chair really is a corporate gift from the Lego group. Um, so a few years ago, um, they essentially have top up and endowment. So in the US, it's very common that university have different endowed chair. Uh, it's slightly less common here in Europe, um, but Lego group have sponsored an endowed chair at the school that I'm teaching at IMD. Um, is essentially a corporate gift, really. Um, the only mandate is we do good research work uh, contributing to the field of management practice. This is essentially the mandate. Um, I happen to also interact quite a bit with the Lego group. We run executive education for them as they also oh, okay. continue to innovate on their own. Um, but essentially it's sort of a long arm length, uh, you know, relations um, that we keep goodwill on both part. And uh, it allowed me to open the center for future readiness. And in large part, my obsession is to understand how do organizations stay future ready? How do team prepare for an ambiguous world? And how do we as individual continue to make sure we are focusing on things that truly matter, whether it's for people around you or even to fulfill your deepest goal? Before we talk about that, just please be honest, how many Lego bricks do you have in your office? I can't even count. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, um, I think the Lego bricks does allow people to broaden the horizon a little bit in terms of communication. You could also do it, Felix. I mean, if you want to do a brainstorming session, instead of doing PowerPoint, I joke about it. Why do PowerPoint, right? There's no power and there's no point. <laughs> Why don't we, you know, use the Lego bricks to build a narrative around, right? <laughs> it's much more taxed for one thing. And when you relay that story, other people can build on top of your creation real time. We're talking about human connection, right? So the moment, sometimes you still have face-to-face -face interaction. Why don't we make it a memorable experience, right? Whether this is a business review meeting, whether this is a strategizing meeting, forget about even post a note. Let's bring some old bricks and build it. First thing we have learned from Howard today is now whenever you are in a room and there's a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> just remind everyone there's no power and there's no point to this and use Lego bricks. I love that. Thank you, Howard. Now, you were born and raised in Hong Kong, we mm -hmm. learned from you, and you actually weren't in banking tr prior to pursuing your, your doctorate. You told us you snuck into Harvard Business School, which is, uh, I mean, very humble of you to say, but why did you decide to make a career transition from banking, a lot more power, a lot more point there, into this field that you're in now and also base your work out of Mont Blanc instead of Hong Kong. Right. Um, how should I put it? It is sort of one of those realization that no matter how quickly I could advance in my career, I probably won't like it. I remember, so I was working in Hong Kong with Citibank at the time and I was going through this management trainee program People were like, oh, you're one of these management associates. Essentially, they just rotate you from one department to the other, right? For two years. And you get <laughs> to go so many to people Singapore right now. Like, yes. for like training. And you feel like you are, oh, you know, maker and shaker, whatnot. And then I was looking at my boss. He's also went through this track and he's a superstar in the bank. And, I, and, and the stress that he needs to endure and also, like, he keep on needing to shouting to people on the phone to get things done. 
And it just one day occurs to me, I don't want his job. And I'm like, oh my God, he's a superstar in the bank. And by the way, he's even bigger superstar now. And I'm like, I don't want his job. So what does it mean? And I have been, oh my gosh, just applying for MBAs everywhere. At the time, I did not think about PhD. I was thinking about MBA because my field of vision is this narrow. And then I remember interviewing and attending some recruitment event with INSEAD, competitor of IMD anyways. So I was there and the recruiter was saying like, from day one, we're going to make sure your CV is good. We're going to push you to networking. I was like, I don't want that. I want a break. <laughs> like I was like 23 year old, right? My God, uh, out of college, not that long ago. And, and I was like, I don't want that immediately. And um, so I was also talking to friends and they were like, well, if you do a PhD, not only is longer, it's also free. You don't pay for tuition. You get a stipend. I was like, what is that? Really? So I Googled it. And sure enough, there's like this whole track of PhD students. So I going into there. Like it is all for pragmatism. I did not plan to become a professor from day one. No way. No way. <laughs> not until I'm on the job market. I actually need a real job. I have no strategy. So I'm always <laughs> skeptical when people say like, you know, I have a vision of who I want to become. Yeah, it helps a little bit. But really, um, I don't know. It's it just me. I, I, I play, play as it lay. I love that. So second thing we're learning from Howard, when somebody tells you, I have a vision, just be skeptical. Just take a step back and ask twice and look twice because there might be nothing. Um, and thank you, Howard, for sharing that and being so honest about you know, your steps out of the corporate world. I saw so many people laughing, nodding, um, just feeling with you and, and shared in the chat. I also got in after seven interviews, then I turned it down. Boom. That's the mic drop moment, Jalisa, that we were talking about. I don't know if you have a sound for that. Yes, that's it. Mic drop. Turn it down. So here we are with you, Howard, and you said in the beginning, you care and work on this one question what makes an organization future ready? So mm. if I would ask you to put that in a, how do you say this now, in an X or in a thread? Like, how would you, how would you say that in a few words? What makes an, an organization future ready? Mm. So it may come across not very fitting in today's age about, you know, people want to make an impact on a planet, but just hear me out and, it would also apply to even to degrowth, right? Um, because it is very real. But essentially at the company or organization level, this is how I speak to my executive participant, right? Because there you go. You win anytime, no matter what kind of environment, you simply are able to win more than competitor. So people would ask me, so what do you mean? Well, when time is good, you grow faster than others. When time is bad, you suffer less. In other words, you win everywhere. So that's the kind of organization I would describe as future ready. Yeah, if you want a hashtag, that would be it. Wow. So you teach this. And when you come into a class with new students like today, yeah. you ha often have a question with you that you bring. And mm. we ask you to ask that question today to the community here in the room. Hmm. This question is, I'm just going to read it now. What is the one lasting acceleration that you want to be a part of? And we're going to put that <laughs> in the chat right now for you. We have this variety of responses from the World Wildlife Fund, from Rashad to uh, Brandon saying, look up from our screens, please. I want to accelerate <laughs> that. To John giving us an amazing uh, quote, as always, John, thank you. In age of acceleration, nothing can be more exhilarating mm. than going slow. Howard, what do you what do you think when you read those <laughs> responses in the chat to this question? How do they compare with what your students say? Yeah, right. Because it's almost tying to the deep desire or the purpose of the individual. And I think John's quote is exactly right that you kind of need to go slow and prioritize so that you could channel your own energy to what really matter. Same thing for organization. When I talk to executives, what is your priorities 
By the way, the word priorities with IES as plural form is a recent phenomena. In old English, it's always singular. Huh. <laughs> that just goes to show, yeah, our attention has been fragmented. We cannot make choices. And oftentimes you reflected on, you know, the corporate context, whether it's medium-sized enterprise all the way to big companies that tended to be almost like all these must-win battles, all these priorities, to-do list, email avalanche. And at the organization level, they couldn't even make the slightest progress in terms of corporate strategy on what truly matter. At the team level, you could... Imagine in your department or in your team, there must be some type of innovation, new way of working you want to instill and you need to scale up. And yet without prioritization properly, the main thing never get done, never get implemented. And same thing for individual level. I remember I had this conversation with a couple of manager and they said like, you know, my agenda is dictated by my email inbox. Uh, so if colleagues want something to get done, I just ask them to send me an email. So that would be my to-do list. You reflect on that, which means that your day-to-day -day activities is dictated by others, not yourself. And, and that is the danger, I think. And I love John's description. You have to go slow to pass out what is the main thing. And that discipline applied to individual all the way to the organization. And I've seen it. Companies that are future-ready, the management team are brutal in cutting down number of to-do lists. We're going to focus on one thing. I mean, all companies try to go through energy transition. If you're in the fossil fuel, if you're car makers, if you're in heavy machinery, you have to transition on that. And you need to cut down priorities, focus on the main thing. So yeah, that's my reflection on that. Wow, so next learning from you is actually to go from priorities back to what this word actually means, a singular word, priority. Yeah, and I guess so. Fascinating. I remember, I, 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 um, yeah. I remember this memoir by the Disney CEO and chairman, Bob Iger, who is now still the uh, CEO. He returned because his uh, successor wasn't doing good enough of a job. But I remember reading his memoir, which is kind of fascinating read. And he said, any company have more than three priorities, have no priority. I think that applies to individual as well. It's pretty drastic, but you know, there's a little bit of wisdom in there. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. I know, sure. right? Just put it in the chat. Well said. <laughs> so let's say you're now in front of this CEO of this, of this large company, mm. and you are the innovation expert, the innovation professor and he asks you so what will make innovation actually possible and what will it make impossible in my company do you have a, a general response to that <laughs> that's a big question but let me step back a little bit because people tend to think innovation requires creativity and strong vision and by now, you probably know that I'm a little skeptical about this idea of having charismatic leader or visionary founder. I mean, those counts. But by and large, if you talk about even medium-sized company, of course, having a vision is important. But oftentimes, people know what is needed. You talk to any company that uh, you know, commands some respect, they can tell you where the world is moving towards. If you're a consumer brand, they would tell you, well, the brand needs to project an image of inclusiveness, sustainability, uh, eco-friendly. They can tell you all that. Everyone knows. If you're a car company, there's nothing hidden in terms of what is needed, right? Connected car, electric vehicle, autonomous driving. Visioning is cheap. In fact, in today's age, like you have ChatGPT, you could just download free McKinsey Report and BCG, lump them together and ask for a summary by ChatGPT. So there is so much knowledge out there and knowledge that is actually the knowing is relatively simple. But what is extremely difficult is to close the knowing and doing gap. And so when CEO asked me, so what is, what is innovation? How do I know my company is innovative enough? Well, is whether you as a company can scale up those critical capability 
ahead of others. And I'm not talking about you need to become Tesla of the world. You don't need to be Microsoft in the absolute sense. You just need to be one inch ahead. <laughs> Slightly better than competitor in terms of scaling up that new capability, then you win any time. So we could go back to some of the real example in the real world. But again, it applies to big company as well as small, medium-sized company to yourself as well. You don't need to be extremely creative to win, but you certainly need to keep an eye on what's going outside of your narrow field so that your contribution is valuable and unique, slightly more than your peer group. And then no matter what happened, you are more safe. And you, when you look at the companies that you work with, what is the biggest hinderer of innovation? What is it a yeah. pattern that you see that makes innovation not happen? Yeah. So I'll give you a very concrete example, right? Of course, Tesla in terms of car company, they are undoubtedly the big winner in the world, right? Number something like number seven, most valuable car, uh, company on the face of the planet. The second car company like GM wasn't even like close. Um, and so is Toyota and so on. But if you think about that, right? Electric vehicle is nothing new. I mean, Tesla did not invent EV at all. Like, and you think about a company like BMW, they have worked on their EV project for a long time. In fact, they had this BMW i brand, many of you might remember, i3. They launched it in 2017 that they get industry award. It was just one year after Tesla launched Model S. In other words, BMW was fast and early and their car people loves it. What subsequently happened actually describe a lot of the things that our audience have described. There's no action. Why there's no action? Well, because EVs sell at a lower volume, the profitability wasn't as high as the traditional gas consuming cars. So the marketing folks inside the company allocate more marketing budget to the traditional offering, not the EV. The manufacturing guy do not like, like the EV because it required retooling. <laughs> and everyone wasn't trying to kill the EV project, but everyone just putting a little bit of a feather. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the whole EV project is carrying a tons of feather. And so nothing goes and slow to a crawl, then talent leave, talent left. And so one of the former executive from BMW, and we could Google it, is completely publicly available information, left BMW and joined Apple for the car project. Now, we don't know whether the Apple car project is going to take off or not, but the reality is employees are pretty smart. When they spot, there's a sign that the company is not really serious to become future ready, in this case, you know, building up EV businesses, then they get demo demotivated and there's a brain drain. So <laughs> that's, that's what happened. A lot of companies know what is needed, but they cannot persist. They get distracted as a result. Wow, and we have a few, I think, Tesla users here in the room, uh, mixed Ooh. experiences, but uh, still with the brand. And I think this also shows innovation, right? It's not perfect, but you are that inch ahead. And because you put yourself out there and people start using your product, you can iterate and you stay in the conversation. Now, another very big question for you, Howard, what is the biggest misconception about innovation? Hmm. I think there is this whole idea about innovation comes off from an episodic inspiration and you need lone genius sort of the Thomas Addison viewpoint mm -hmm. or is embodied with the myth around Steve Jobs, right? <laughs> or this larger than life founder like NVIDIA, whatever. But the reality is innovation having an impact to the marketplace all the way to societal impact is always serendipitous. Um, so if people actually read back to the bibliography of uh, Steve Jobs, he did not invent it the whole iPad and iPhone, his engineers pushed him to explore that. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest uh, misperceptions is exactly that. We think 
it required a lone genius to literally arrive with a light bulb. No, even Thomas Edison required a whole industrial complex to bring the light bulbs literally to life. But Howard, in your book, your book is called Leap, How to Thrive in a World Where Everything Can Be Copied. I mean, the title Leap already says it. You say needers need to take a leap. So what would you say to employees then who think, well, how should I take a leap? I mean, it's it's already hard for me to give and catch up with daily business. Mm. What, what is the right way to to communicate that to people that work with you, that that leap? Yeah. So so what I noticed is um, among big companies, especially, uh, it's always busy, right? Inside a big company, there's always like, you know, everything activities. Is everything is important. It's very overwhelming and everyone is nervous. And yet, no matter how chaotic at the workplace, you always find certain individuals just calm. <laughs> no matter what happened, they just going to exert consistent effort on stuff that is like, oh, why, why do you pay so much attention to this? And I think it comes down to this. They actually are working on a project while they're contributing to the corporate agenda. It also helped them build their own skills. So I had a conversation with a, uh, actually the top scientist, one of the top scientists in the pharmaceutical companies. And what I track is she has all this autonomy and freedom inside the company. I was like aghast. Here is a scientist, may may not be the smartest one, but she has the biggest autonomy in the whole company. She can walk on water. And what I noticed is she just craft her own perfect niche, meaning she keep on building new capability, new skills. So she's a trained microbiologist, then learning about, you know, the whole genomics things. And then starting with like computational biology, she just keep on laying on top of new skills, bit by bit by bit. As a result, it becomes unique. The pharmaceutical firm depending on her more than she depending on the company. And so if you ask me, how do I think about my long-term prospect of a career? is essentially, well, the industry must be trending and accelerating in certain directions. We all know. Your company probably articulating a strategy. You just make sure you pick up a new skill deep enough so that your contribution is valuable and unique. And this is how you preserve your own autonomy. Um, but if you're even independent, I think that's also equally important too. And that's what I wanted to talk about because we talked about the Teslas, you know, Tesla, led by the richest man in the world. Then you just talked about a pharmaceutical company, often also limitless means. But many mm -hmm. of us are not in that world. Many of us yeah. are self-employed or they are in family-owned businesses or they work in SMBs, yeah. where this is much harder because the sheer workload on every single individual is much more existential to the company. Yeah. So what do you, what advice do you have for the self-employed that you just mentioned or for smaller businesses who do not even want to become the next Tesla? Yes. But still yeah. want to stay that inch ahead. Yeah. So, so in my work, um, so we compare big company in terms of how they become future ready. Um, but the lesson learned is comes down to one headline, right? Future ready organization, regardless of the size, needs to perform and transform at the same time. Meaning if you are a singular independent, I have my own web store <laughs> and, and it's okay. You could stay small and beautiful. But here's the thing I have observed in any, regardless of size of the company, small can be beautiful. But in today's world, it needs to be advanced. Let me describe what I meant. Um, whether it's a five people team, five person team, all the way to a 500,000 enterprise, right? If a lot of the daily work is very manual and nothing automated, then we're in deep trouble. <laughs> so, you know, you could think about whether I am an independent consultant for clients. If everything you do from the back end to the front end is all manually intensive, then it is actually very fragile because you couldn't scale and every client you need to handhold a lot. So it is very important, regardless of the size of the company, to think about what can I standardize? So 
Everyone can think about that. Once you standardize, then you write it down so that you could pass along other subcontractor with ease. So codify knowledge. That's a big word. Just write down what you know. <laughs> and then the third, then you could easily start to thinking about where can I automate a little bit? Now, again, we're not talking about you become Tesla tomorrow. You just need to be one inch ahead of your competition. So if you're an independent graphic designer, you just need to be one inch slightly better than your next door competitor. Then you are the king or queens. Um, so that's how I see um, how you uh, essentially stay future ready. Wow. So even if you're self-employed, try to find the processes in your workday that you could standardize, automate on, and that makes you more efficient because it will allow you to learn, have more time for learning, stay an inch ahead, and learn new skills and, and transform over time. Aveli says in the chat, so much good information here. And Robin has a very specific question. When mm. it comes to innovation, there's always, especially now, you know, with the IRA and Biden just coming out talking about AI for the first time, there's yeah. now a huge focus on how can governments actually be at the steering wheel of innovation. So it doesn't yeah. go too fast, it doesn't go too slow. What do you think about that? Robin yeah. said she's really curious to know, you know, about like your you, what do you think about the role of government when it comes to innovation? Mm. So at least in the Western world, um, you could see from U.S. to Europe, um, there's almost this realization we need better industrial policy, right? We have been gone through too long of time in the French world, laser affair. The government step back and just let the market do everything. And turns out it's disaster after disaster. And, and so you're beginning to see a reverse trend of government stepping up and have industrial policy all the way to different types of act being described here. So for companies, first for company first, um, the way I have heard executives start to think about particular forward-looking companies, because you could always say, oh, we are thinking about going into fossil fuel transition. Our solution doesn't generate a lot of profit. So how do I think about these? Think about these as option. One can never time the market. <laughs> the government policy may happen tomorrow or may happen in five years. So you cannot really time the market, but it comes down to whether you are prepared, whether you have built up those organizational capability so that by the time the government actually put I don't know, another carbon trade cap, then you're ready to capitalize those changes right away. So it is about capability buildings. At the individual level, again, uh, we all kind of know where is the industry moving in the medium term. So with OpenAI and ChatGPT, we know what kind of work we really need to be much more sensitive around automation. So you kind of think ahead a little bit. What is the next thing that I need to master ahead of the curve? So, so by the time that move and that option came, you're ready. Thank you, Robin. I hope this is a little bit helpful um, for, your, for your writing uh, right now. Thanks for, for joining us today. And Howard, because you were just talking about governments in different regions in the world, you're such a global citizen is there a place in the world a region a country maybe a digital tribe that you encountered somewhere that is an inch ahead is there a certain geographics you're looking into for inspiration when it comes to innovation or have you encountered any maybe unique cultural factors mm. that enable innovation in specific regions of the world it is really a it is really a variation of different development these days, particularly if, you, if you're looking at the geopolitics, right? With the, with the split and decoupling between China and the US, you know, when, when, when I go on the road, sometimes I see a radically different trajectory when in Europe and US, it conformed to certain standard. And when I'm looking into you know, whether it's China or Middle East or Latin America, they really pursued a very different trajectory. Um, so I think, you know, without laying on a judgment, who's right, who's wrong, I think it is important for us to keep an open mind to looking inside each of these ecosystems, 
what are the winning species that they emerge? <laughs> so in, in, in Switzerland and uh, across big part of Europe and US, uh, some of you may already use Timu, right? This is this new e-commerce giant, T-E-M-U, which you buy all this cheap stuff around, uh, you know, all of a sudden it's bigger than H&M and Zyra. And so how do they build that business? I think today we even need to harbor that curiosity to understand what is going on. Whether you agree with that business model or not, that's a second level. But I think we need to just sensitize so that we are not having that filter. And back to your question, which country I'm actually very excited or curious about the way they innovate. I tend to like looking at small nations for some reason. <laughs> so Estonia, of course, um, about how they embrace e-citizens, government you know, services is all online. It's amazing. And then you look in Asia, like take a look of city state like Singapore. My God, like how did they put fintech to the center growth of the whole tiny nation and extra outsized influence to the neighborhood? So I, I do like this whole notion of small but beautiful. It applies to companies as well as nations too. And big applause came from Aveli here who just before you mentioned it, uh, said in the chat for those interested in innovation in tech government, et cetera check out Estonia. Um, so you said it, uh, you said it, Howard. And, you know, I also want to want to quote John who put in the chat, codifying knowledge is crucial to keeping the ground from eroding beneath as you move forward. We did a lot of that today. I think you really gave us a, a look into your framework that you have applied with so many companies out there from very, very big uh, to very, very small to your own students that you're helping helping us in the future to to manage the world. And lastly, Howard, this is a little bit selfish, but we're at the end of the season. So I just wanted to ask mm. you, what is your advice for us here at Remote Daily to stay an inch ahead of the curve? Ah, so for me, I think you, you already felt that way already. Like, you know, the whole idea of you know, the traditional way of working is over. <laughs> um, and, and I think a lot of companies beginning to wake up the importance of intergenerational exchange. And I think, you know, there's this whole, you know, super opportunity that you have already built as a platform to bring people across the world together. But it's also across ages. Maybe it is important because to solve all these big problem that we're facing and we need that intergenerational wisdom um, and 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 I fear that people beginning to you know cast one generation against the the other I see that sometimes jokes offhand comment inside companies mm -hmm. and in voting <laughs> election that's even more traumatic but what is required is exactly that because it's about diversity of thoughts. Also, beyond the critical one that we are trying to tackle and overcome, but also intergenerational could be one as well. Amazing advice, Howard. Thank you so much. And yes, on September 15, when we start with one of America's leading writers, thinkers, activists, Baratunde Thurston, uh, I think he's younger than me. Uh, then we have Amy Webb, the world's leading futurist, join us in the next season, who is uh, slightly older. We have corporate Natalie, who is a Gen Z influencer who started out in the pandemic to tell jokes on TikTok about corporate life, who is um, in her 20s. We're trying, but we could do much better on this. And I'm really grateful for your advice here, Howard. And I really uh, want to thank you for taking the time in your evening, uh, emptying out a hotel lobby to create this beautiful Swiss, French, Alpine, Mont Blanc background and uh, to share your beautiful baritone voice with us and teach us so much about innovation going into the summer. There's so many bleak things that every one of us is confronted with every day. And I think you made it easier for all of us today to look into the future. Final question, what would mm. you like to share with us uh, before we, we part our ways into this weekend, into the summer? Is there anything we can do to support you? Is there anything oh, you would like to announce? So do you have a live motto that you want to share? 
Just go ahead. So um, for those who are curious about companies staying future ready, uh, check out the uh, IMD, the official website, and you could either search uh, future readiness. We forced the school SEO team to make sure it's number one across the world. Otherwise, um, you could click onto my personal website, which just posted, and there's the newsletter so that we could stay in touch and feel free to connect me on LinkedIn. Yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Howard, you're amazing. We all want to be your students again. I hope we can see you again on the show. HowardU.org and HowardU.org slash newsletter is where you can get more of Howard. I want to thank you all for being part of Remote Daily. We, we will reach out to you over the summer and bye-bye. Mm -hmm.